Oh. Oh, okay. I do. Let me try to get it more. Is it okay now? That looks fine to me. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it looks good on our end as well. So basically, it went through a couple of iterations. Uh, most of the people in the call were in the loop, except for last minute change where only the people that were awake, so that was basically Daniel and myself, we made some final changes. But the big changes are to address Magnus' uh, block. Uh, he wanted to get the scope, so that's the reason why the, the highlighted text is here. Um, and there was too much prime time for HIP. So now HIP is still there, but it can kind of, um, I wouldn't say hidden, but less obvious. Uh, sorry, Bob, but I think it's, it's mandatory. And we change as well this, this part. Please read, right? It's a very really important. I think with this one, uh, we will get two blocks, right? Magnus. He's unable to read it before Monday. I don't know if he's traveling or he reloaded. Uh, but Ben read it again, seen the tele chat a couple of year, uh, hours ago, and he said, I am okay with it now. We want to change a few things, uh, but that's really minor. And the few things he wants to change, it's the boundary word requirements. Uh, is it technical requirements or legal requirements coming from the CAA? So I think simply adding here, Technical requirements, list the technical requirements, and then we are all set. But again, I think it's really up to you now, the, the future working group, or at least the, the people in this call. Yeah, so, so be, to be clear, I, I saw the discussion on, you know, what do we really mean by requirements? Um, so at a high level, um, we don't get to specify requirements, the regulators do, right? And then, and then one level down from that, we don't even get to specify uh, the basic technical means of compliance because the regulators in both Europe and the US have already gone to ASTM International for that. But one level deeper, we do get to specify the requirements for bringing IETF protocols to bear on the problem um, in a way that complements the work that ASTM has done. So I don't know if we want to say something like that explicitly, or if everybody's now happy with the language that we have on requirements. If the requirements, it doesn't tell anything here about the source of the requirement, but the document that will be produced by the potential working group, I think should be obviously technical requirements. Where they're coming from is a different story. Yeah, although I, I would kind of hate to recapitulate every requirement that's in the regulations or the ASTM document, because those are hundreds of pages. I don't remember who said it. It was in an email just today of maybe part of the working group's task is to look at the legal ish requirements on all sides and then just make a general thing that could apply everywhere. I don't know if I read that incorrectly. Somebody said that, yeah. But I, that's what I felt like the direction was going towards for requirements to bring the legal side in. Yeah, I, I guess I'm trying to be real careful and not um, step outside, you know, our authority. Uh, you know, the regulators do what the regulators do, ASTM does what ASTM does, and, and I think we really want to focus on what IETF does. Um, certainly, we have to capture what the regulators have said and what ASTM has said insofar as it drives uh, what we would do. And uh, just to, um, so Michael Richardson is 
on a tram, so he's muted. He says, the general statement sounds good. Can we access all of the ASTN, I think he meant M, documents? So I'll answer the last question first. Um, the ASTM documents, once they are published, which this one isn't yet, um, are publicly available for a fee. Um, the ASTM documents that have not yet been published, such as this one, although it has been approved for publication, um, it's still in an editor queue, um, those are available only to people who joined ASTM, which is why I joined ASTM. It cost me, I don't know, somewhere between 50 and 100 bucks. So this will be challenging, right? This is because what we call behind a paywall or a member wall. So basically, it means that we cannot use really them as a reference. But again, what we need to do is technical requirements, because that's what the ITF does. The ITF does not do anything thinking that this requirement meets this legal requirement. We cannot say this, right? right. So you are on the both seats or on both chair, um, but on the ITF side, we need to stick to technical stuff. And getting the, this reference will need to be uh, most probably disappearing from the, the reference we have. And the maximum will be um, informative. Right. So, what, so I guess what I'm suggesting is in, in the area where it says the working group will work on the following items, one requirements expected to provide an information document that lists the requirements for UAS mode identification. If we could narrow that to that lists the technical requirements for applying IETF standardized protocols to UAS remote identification. Because otherwise we're getting into technical requirements about, you know, the anti tamper hardware and all kinds of things that really go outside of, of our world. Of course, of course. So what would you suggest for the sentence? Uh, just just say lists the technical requirements for applying IETF protocols to UAS remote identification. Okay, sounds good to me. Thank you. I think it's good. Uh, Michael Richardson also asked, uh, can we do a liaison? So that's a good thing. Um, getting a liaison statement from ASTM, so basically getting ASTM sending an email to the ATF, and there's a procedure uh, and reference rate, will help a lot. Specifically, if the statement includes some deadlines. So for the liaison, um, sorry, do we have an ETA for the uh, ASTM documentation to be published? I don't know. Well, so we thought it would be published by now, but the ASTM balloted on the standard in November. And then um, in December, the FAA published the notice of proposed rulemaking and it surprised everybody. It has things in it that are gonna require changes to the ASTM standard. And I don't have visibility into the innards of the ASTM process, but I think they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place here because the changes that they're going to need to make based upon the FAA and PRM are substantive changes. They're not just editorial typographical changes. So they can't just be made by the ASTM editors. They have to go back out with a revision of the standard and reballot. Um, and I don't know how long it's going to take. Yeah, so that, that's like a chicken egg problem. So um, two things, um, this, the draft, the ITF draft has been he heavily studied this uh, ASTM documentation. So, um, uh, for us, we're not a member of that, so we don't have access to that. I mean, we, we, even if we try to understand that, that's, uh, there's no way we can, uh, for you guys to share with us at all. And the second thing is um, uh, the FAA has been uh, has a send a notification that they're going to extend the comment period for the rulemaking, right? Because they are receiving uh, tons of uh, controversial comments. Uh, 
uh, for the for the for, for the announcement they did on December. So that's going to I believe that's going to put more delays on the ESTM publications. I don't see how, at least the way it's shaping it as visible so far, that subsequent changes to the messages themselves will occur. Um, uh, sorry, Bob. Can you, would, 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 Bob, would you please uh, put the mic close to your mouth? Okay, it's, sorry. It's, uh, it's, yeah, that's much better. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, this is more of a guess on my part, but from what I have seen from my view, I don't think there'll be sufficient changes to the ASTM proposed messages unless Route 4 is knocked out as one of the um, recommended um, media. Uh, so, the direction we are at it, our focus, I think, um, is um, safe to pursue and to move forward. Um, while um, um, the FAA and ASTM scratch their collective heads on what to do. Um, that's just my own limited read of things. Yeah, uh, Stu here, I agree with Bob. Although the surprise that the FAA um, came out with is gonna delay publication of the ASTM standard, the things that it's gonna require changing are not things that directly affect us. Uh, for instance, um, they are requiring pressure altitude as opposed to a GPS altitude. We don't care where the altitude came from. You know, the communications protocol is is transparent to you know what was the origin of the datum. Um, another thing that they did is they they said, well, we need an indication of the emergency status of the aircraft. All right. Well, that's just one more bit that we need to carry. Um, in the message structure, uh, but it doesn't fundamentally also need to sign the messages and you know where they come from and where they go to and, and so on. So so while it's um, troublesome that we don't have a published standard that we can point to, uh, at the same time uh, we do know what we need to do from the from this from the pre-publication standard. Uh, I'm just calling attention to the chat just because Eric and uh, Michael while this discussion was happening was typing um, I'm just going to speak it out so Michael is saying he thinks the document should recap in one to two sentences any technical needs which are driven by legal requirements so our document is somewhat self-contained Eric also agrees with Michael and there I think he was I said it, the, the sentence which I allotted to the chat are now in blue uh, I'm just wondering what is this enough for Michael and the others for this. Yeah, so um, I'll come up with the proper name for the European Union CAA. And just as the FAA has an NPRM, there are a couple of actual published regulations from the, from the European CAA. I'd like to actually cite those in the charter. Um, if if you don't mind, I'd like to take one more pass on the charter, just putting in nits like that, the European Union references, um, and and clarifying a couple of phrases that people in their comments um, were struggling with. Just I mean, we reach basically this charter like it is now. I'm 99% confident it will pass the first pass of the IESG, right? So basically. The AG will say, okay, this charter is good for us. Let's make it public to the complete AATF and other parties. So whatever in the world, whether it's correct. So I would hate uh, that we lose this confidence. But now, uh, if it's minor stuff, I, I don't think it's, it's okay. Yeah, I don't want to do any violence to it. I'd just like to add the reference to the European Union um, regulations. And there were... There were two phrases that people didn't understand what was meant by them that I could rewrite to clarify. Um, a number of people said, you know, how are we going to make the information useful? How are we going to make the information immediately useful? And actually the phrase I had originally used was immediately actionable. 
So I can give an example. I'm not suggesting the example. Yeah, but, the, but this one, immediately actionable, was completely refused by everyone because what does it mean? If you want to get the working group working fast, that's one thing. But was it something else? Right. It was definitely something else. The idea is I, I'm sitting here as an air defense operator and I need to know whether or not to shoot this thing down. Okay. That is immediately actionable information. And um, in order for me to know whether I need to shoot this thing down, maybe I need to talk to the pilot and say, who are you and what are you doing and why are you here? And maybe I get an answer from the pilot that makes clear to me that he's someone who's simply confused and I need to tell him to turn left instead of turning right. Uh, or maybe I get a, you know, an indication that, no, this guy is, is, uh, is malicious in nature. Um, the, 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 one of the fundamental problems, uh, in my mind, the fundamental problem with the ASTM approach, is that it gives you information that not only can you not know who said it, there's no signature, but you can't do anything with it quickly. It involves human eyeballs looking at a screen, a human picking up a telephone, calling somebody who may or may not answer the phone. By that time, a malicious aircraft has already done its dirty work. Or even an aircraft that's being flown by someone who's confused or ill-informed, you haven't had the opportunity to contact them and say, no, you need to, you need to descend to 200 feet or you need to go up to 300 feet or whatever. There's no way in the ASTM standard to immediately use the information to, for instance, communicate with the guy. So that's what I meant by immediately actionable or immediately useful. You ought to be able to push a button and communicate with the pilot. And ASTM just doesn't enable you to do that. Okay, I understood now. But this is the kind of thing you cannot really write in the charter because the ATF doesn't really care, right, on this. They care about getting useful information, and that's it. Um, so I'm all fine to keep this actionable, community of actionable outside of the charter, honestly. We may end up somewhere in the requirements maybe, but that's it. Okay. I think that's a good compromise, right. keeping it out of the charter, but right. having it part of the architecture, the right. requirements. Okay. And then, I mean, my main concern is to get a charter through that doesn't prevent me from doing what I need to do. Uh, but I'm just trying to respond to the people who found certain phrases confusing. The other one that they found confusing was make information available via the internet for network grid as opposed to send it uh, one way locally over broadcast grid. Broadcast grid, the unmanned aircraft itself, transmits directly over a data link to the observer device. Network grid, the unmanned aircraft system, which might be the aircraft itself or it might be the ground control station, transmits over the internet to servers that then store the information and observer devices can query those servers. So that is what was meant by those, which once again, in the interest of brevity, I didn't write out that whole long description. But do we, do we, need, to, do we need to answer that question about you know, what those really mean? Honestly, I understand what was meant there, but getting directly or indirectly, brings nothing to the sentence. So let's read like this. Like it is right now. You know, and this sentence I remove directly and indirectly, but we kept locally and globally, which is in most of the ITF people is exactly what you mean. Okay. Uh, so it was a reword from directly and directly to locally globally. Okay. It was actually indirectly globally and uh, in directly locally or something like that. So, but this, yeah, that's basically it. Okay. Now, uh, you are more than, uh, we have most probably, if you can send me the, your, your change and to send to the group, so it, it, it's a working group decision, <laughs> yeah, finally, uh, or the potential working group um, for tomorrow would be cool. Yes. And basically, I'm going on vacation on, on, on already on Saturday morning, right? So it should be Friday, end of my business day. So roughly this time. Okay. Uh, okay, so it sounds like the only thing that I really need to add is the European Union references. Yep. Then it would be easy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not <laughs> conflictual, at least. So 
don't, don't say easy. We're just gonna jinx it. <laughs> so, um, so the shelter is down. So, how do we proceed to try to have a liaison now? That's something that needs to be handled by the ISG, or no, no, no. The liaison is starting from the outside. Okay. So with ASTM, they say, hey, the IATF uh, is, is done by the ISG, but it's the IATF community, and there is a procedure, right? If you look about IATF liaison, there is a statement, how to say a statement, and it's basically an email or a fax, but I mean, it's an email, right? Telling, hey, we want you to work on this and this and this for this reason, blah 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 blah, and our timeline is blah 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 blah. Okay, so it's going to be a liaison from ASTM to ITF. Ask, okay. Asking basically the ITF to work on this. It, it always okay. helps, right? Okay. Um, Stu, Adam, Ryan, is that feasible, you think? Or do you know who to contact? I know, I know who to contact. contact, and he's friendly, but I'm concerned that the ASTM hierarchy is likely to regard this as an infringement on their turf and not be particularly interested in requesting the IETF's help. Yeah, we're going to have to navigate that. Okay. So, we will happen to reference IETF documents where what about uh, participation in generating anything new seems to be problematic. You were really oh, missing, Bob. Uh, they, they're perfectly happy to reference IETF RFPs, but to participate or to ask IETF to do something new seems to be the challenge. Correct. And so the email should be sent to um, the AD, the chairs, the... No, um, I, I send an email, I guess okay, that's something. In, yeah. That's in there, okay. I will have a look then. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's something um, we, we, we need to put on the agenda to, um, to look at, to sort of establishing that kind of liaison. Okay. And, on top, I just want to mention one more thing on top of the Michael. Um, GPP has been started the uh, UAS thing already. Uh, there's two working group, SA2 and SA6. They're working on a different aspect. Uh, SA2 just started and SA6 started a couple of meetings back. Uh, I can foresee there will be some overlappings between IETF and FHPP. Um, I'm not sure this is also our concerns. I mean, believe me, if it's really going to move very fast on that, and um, um, so, so I can. So I don't see Michael's um, uh, chat on that, but um, if he knows, I mean, um, I can, it's something. If he know, if he has, has some information, that's something I can look at at 3GPP. But I don't think 3GPP overlaps with the ITF. I think they they're working pretty well together. So um, so I'm not too concerned about that. But um, if they are working with 3GPP, it might be good. They work uh, the same way with the ITF. So that that's something um, might we might I mean um, I can refer you uh, some of the uh, links regarding the VHPP's work. So okay, it, it's better get out of the way. Um, but still, I think Bob knows that it, um, already. Good good liaison with three GPP. I get to have a stand liaison with three GPP. It's Gonzalo Camino, so the the chair of HIP. And the co-chair of this this booth, so Gonzalo knows. Yeah. So please send me the whatever you know about 3GPP, and um and um we will try to fix that to clarify that at least. I will do that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So now I think we can. Uh, so. Now we can um, go to the, um, the requirements, the technical requirements. 
Um, so I am going to open So please, Steve, if you're speaking, you're a mute. We are no, not mute. I'm just waiting for Adam to pull up the slides and then we can share them. Okay, but uh, do you see my screen or no? No, we no, see, your, see face. your face. Okay. So I'm gonna try to make it a little bit more useful. So I'm sharing the screen. Yep, there it goes. Starting to share. Okay, now we see your screen. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. So uh, there we go. All right, most of you have seen this one before. Um, all I've really done here is updated it to say that the European Union regulations were already issued and they become effective sometime around June 15th. I need to check the exact date. Uh, and the NPRM has now actually been issued and the comment period ends March 1st, unless they extend it and we're getting mixed signals on whether they're going to do that or not. I think um, it was a decision of no. That was the last I heard. Um, and then the last point that I added here is that there's going to be a long lock in here. This isn't something that we can get right the day after they issue these rules because, you know, they're going to be, you know, a million aircraft made to the rule and then nobody's going to want to be told, oh, well, we changed the rules. So you need to throw away your aircraft. And for the low cost one, that's really what it will be is, is throw it away. Um, so let's see, is there any other updates in here? Um, yeah, I added uh, EPP uh, on the provisioning side for who is, and I think those are all the updates to the version of the slide that was seen at the BOF. Okay, just one question. Um, I can read that um, the European Union is going to be um, have its regulation effective in June 15. Um, does it mean they are way ahead the U.S. regulation or? Yes, the, the, the U.S. started out in the lead with the Aviation Rulemaking Committee, which delivered its final recommendations in September of 2017. But then the FAA got bogged down after that point, whereas the European Air and Space Agency, I think that's what they're called, um, EASA, uh, what? European Aviation Safety Administration. Thank you. European Aviation Safety Administration. All right, um, from Ryan. Um, yeah, anyway, they moved out on it. And in uh, June or July of 2019, they issued regulations that they said would become effective one year later. And they also left themselves some wiggle room that they you know, were likely to make some changes to those regulations, but they have in fact issued regulations. And what's interesting about the European regulations is that um, unlike the FAA, which reversed itself, uh, on broadcast versus network. Um, the EU stuck with the idea that broadcast would be the, the baseline. Um, they also are only allowing the use of a static manufacturer assigned hardware serial number as the aircraft's ID. And there's a huge problem with that because even if that ID isn't uh, itself personally identifiable information, and even if that ID doesn't allow a random member of the public to look up personally identifiable information, what it does is allows any observer to correlate patterns of use, patterns of life, and see that this particular aircraft, you know, every Monday flies to McDonald's and then to Walmart or, or whatever, right? And, you know, we're, we're all familiar with traffic analysis, 
This is traffic analysis of, of physical space traffic as opposed to you know, network space traffic. So anyway, uh, the EU hopefully uh, will be amenable to a better way, which we can easily show them. Mm, okay. So the expectation is that we focus on FAA um, uh, requirements. And I mean, um, I mean, our requirements are going to be more constrained. I mean, our FAA requirements, the, the requirements we, we're going to work on for a technical solution are going to match those of the EU. And one of the reasons is that the, we, I mean, the FAA has more um, um, EU, especially in terms of privacy. Yeah, so my hope is that we can provide tools that can be either used or not used by operators and registries and their choice of which tools they will use may be constrained by the CAA in whatever jurisdiction they are in, right? So we'll give them things that can be used with a manufacturer assigned hardware serial number, but there will be you know, consequences of, of that choice, if choice it is, or, or consequences of being in a, in a jurisdiction that requires you to do it that way. Uh, but then they'll also have the option to do things that are uh, one-time use. Okay. We're really more focused on the one-time use stuff than the, than the static stuff. Mm -hmm. So one thing you have to also to keep in mind is that um, even in that working group, uh, we, I don't think, but Eric can contradict me, but uh, I don't think we want to come with two solutions to do the same thing and uh, ask the people to do whatever they want. So, yeah, I mean, it's not so much two solutions. It's, it's, okay. first, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's like a, a mode switch or a, or a parameter switch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Indeed, if it's parameter, then it's easy to fix, but if there are really two different protocols or whatever that's becoming really complex. And right, no, not, not looking at two different protocols, just looking at, you know, different classes of identifier. And, you know, I mean, we, we've already got both broadcast grid and network grid to deal with. We kind of need to support both of them. Um, and then in the US, both broadcast and network grid already have a choice of two different types of identifiers, the static uh, manufacturer assigned or the UTM system assigned. Whereas in Europe, there's, there's no choice. It's just the manufacturer assigned. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just more to to get um, that you are aware of the the ITF context. Um, it's not possible we got two different things to do the same thing. Right. Right. At least not in the same working group. Yeah, uh, but um, we try to to avoid that even across working groups. <laughs> yep. Anyway, that, that's all I had in this slide. Okay. Next slide. This just sets the context that somebody who's on the ground, who's looking at an aircraft, the first question is, can they identify it? Yes or no? And then if they can identify it, they may be able to classify it into, oh, well, this is one that I can task. I can say, would you go please pick up a quart of milk for me? Or is this one that is of low concern? I can't ask it to do anything for me other than maybe in an emergency situation to, you know, to move away from the fire. Uh, or is it one that's of, of high concern to me? for for whatever reason and that's that's on the operator to do that classification but we are enabling him we are we are facilitating his making those decisions through the information that we provide to him and um astm has taken the position that remote id is an application and that it is an end in itself and it's there to provide you an id and then happy joy joy we've got an id we're done we can go home whereas everybody else is saying no ids have a purpose you use an ID to do something, um, such as to then establish uh, vehicle to vehicle communications and, and know who you're talking to. Um, so I've been taking the broader than ASTM view that an ID is a, a starting point, not an end point. But so you will listen to an ID and then how do you, do you make a request for, for um, to reach authority associated to to the id or do you say i want to to preach i mean um 
if it's a low concern, you probably have a local re regulation. If it's a high concern, you might uh, talk to the, the pilot directly, or is that something like that? Or you say, I want to talk to this uh, ID with this kind of um, uh, um, level of uh, importance. I think it was, I think it was your next to last suggestion that if something is of high concern, then I probably want to contact the pilot and directly from the pilot get a sense of, of whether I should be afraid. Um, and, and that goes back to my whole point about immediately actionable or immediately useful. Um, if we can use this identity to then reach out and touch the pilot, um, that's great. Now, you don't want everybody who's in the park who's annoyed with the buzzing drones to be able to reach out and bother the pilot. There needs to be some sort of um, access control, some sort of gateway on this mm. establishment of that connection. But you know that, that's something we've done before. We don't have to do that. Okay, yeah, yeah. But so there are only three ways to, to, to contact uh, someone associated to that ID. Well, right now in, in the ASTM standard, there's no way specified. Okay. You, 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 you get an ID and then assuming that you have internet connectivity, you use that internet connectivity to look up information based upon that ID. And that's human eyeballs looking at a screen. And then based upon the information you find in the registration record, you pick up a phone or you type a letter in your word processor and you send it off in the mail to say cease and desist. And, and the point is that none of these are immediate, right? All of these, they, they may be good for an inquest about, you know, how did the busload of school children die, but they're of no use in preventing the busload of school children from dying. And so that's, that's really my whole thrust is to put the observer directly into contact with the pilot right then and there so the situation can be addressed. There is something even worse than that in the ASTM doc, and that's the system method. It potentially gives the GPS location of the pilot. That means that you can walk over there and hit him over the head because the, the, the UA is making too much noise for the conscience. Right. So in so in those versions of RID that transmit in the clear the location of the ground control station has got a pilot seated at it, manipulating the controls of the aircraft, um, that's, a, that's a huge danger to the pilot. Um, you know, we haven't seen this yet, but I could easily envision, um, you know, after some unfortunate event, uh, lynch mobs beating the hell out of uh, drone pilots. Identified a number of issues that I didn't have to address from a privacy um, line here. Um, AI, I can't focus on the protocol, but the recognition that we need to in is that there is indeed backlash. Bob, again, we don't hear you. We cannot understand you. Uh, sorry. Um, that we recognize major privacy deficiency in the ASTM document and the European Union um, standardization on a fixed um, um, set of bits for the ID. Uh, just two protocols to that, but we need protocols such that there is back then there's authorized personnel information we need to back down. Um, and there are a lot of these Okay, so do we want to go on to the next slide? Okay, this is just some terminology um, because we've got two different communities here, each of which has its own jargon that the other one is not necessarily familiar with. Um, okay. so we've had to talk a lot about certificates and we don't mean you know, X.509 or whatever, we mean really, really concise um, HIP oriented certificates in the vision that we've been pursuing thus far because the constraints of Bluetooth 4.X mean that we just don't have very many bytes to work with. 
Uh, can I ask a question? Um, do we understand uh, the the type of drones um, both ESTM or FAA focus on? Are they focused on this is small drones, which is like less than? Yeah, um, yeah. sure. Yes. Well, have you read the EU regs yet? No, I have not. Oh, okay, let me give you the EU answer first. Okay. The EU defines tier zero, one, two, and three. Tier zero are really small, slow, short range, lightweight, um, things that are regarded as presenting a negligible threat. And so essentially no remote ID requirement is levied on them. At the opposite end of the scale, tier three are big, fast, they fly high, long ranges, easily weaponized, et cetera. And they say, that's not in the scope of remote ID either, because we're going to fly those with ADSB, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Mode B, which is what is used by larger manned aircraft. So it is only Tier 1 and Tier 2 that the EU concerns itself with in UAS Remote ID. Tier 1 is smaller, Tier 2 is bigger. Tier 1 can use either broadcast or network remote ID. Tier 2 must use both broadcast and network remote ID, and then the FAA narrows it down still further to say that in the equivalent of the EU's tier one, you must use specifically network, can't use broadcast. And that's one of the things that they're getting a lot of pushback on. That goes way above our pay grade. We'll provide mechanisms that can be used however that battle ends up. And to answer your question on the types of drones, specifically physically, there really hasn't been that much of a focus. It's kind of been broad. I mean, you have DJI coming in, so you have consumer grade drones uh, being part of this. And because of the FAA's regulations, any drone over 0.55 pounds. But under 55 pounds. But under 55 pounds is regulated under the FAA to remote ID. Provided so, it stays under 400 feet. And if it flies under 400 feet, it has to be treated like a big manned aircraft. Yep. So now, in terms th of this all said, be aware that there is an emerging, you won't find it in writing, but you'll hear it in the conference hallways consensus that UTM, the Unmanned Aircraft System Traffic Management, is the future of ATM air traffic management, that the lessons that we are learning with small unmanned aircraft are going to be the basis of the next generation of air traffic control for all aircraft. And the International Civil Aviation Organization, the ICIO, they are working on trust frameworks for all aviation. And we are looking to feed into that, not just um, the drones. We got to do the, the little drones first, Prove we got it right, and then it can expand out to other stuff. But I agree, we needed to do it right. But we know how FA is slow, right? I mean, if <laughs> the future of the ATM won't be happening in the next ten years. I mean, that's what I'm guessing. So if we would do it like for near, yeah, foresee future in the next couple of years, see how. UTM works, uh, you know, I, I would not think if the other organization think ATM will be future soon. So this is one of the, my concerns. Another thing is uh, I, it's related to the type of drones that I'm asking. It's, it's not going to be feasible for the small drones, right, to carry a network, like see SIM card to have a network connections. I believe that's FAA's regulation, right? On top of the EU. No, no, that's a, that's a common misconception. In broadcast remote ID, under the FAA rules, the broadcast must come directly from the unmanned aircraft. However, in network remote ID, under the FAA's proposed rules, the information has to come from the unmanned aircraft system. The distinction between the UA and the UAS is that the UAS includes the ground control station. So in other words, if I'm out there in the park and I'm flying around and I'm using, oh, my tablet or my 
uh, smartphone to control my aircraft, well, my tablet or my smartphone that's on the ground with me in my hand can be the source of the network information. It doesn't actually have to come off the aircraft. And the C2 between the UA and the GCS, the uh, information can then be forwarded to that ID without the UA needing internet connectivity. The, the GCS thus is a proxy for the information. Thanks for the clarification. That's that's really helpful. Thanks. Okay, so do we want to move to the next slide? Let you know I have a hard 3, 8, 3 p.m. cut off. Okay, well we're moving pretty slowly, so we better move along. Uh, all right, this is I yeah, this is the summary of the oh no, back up one. Yeah, go back, go back one. Back up one. AS, the, yeah. No, ASTM. We're looking for the ASTM slide. Right there. Yeah. Another one. Daniel, another one. Forward, if we may. Yeah. Right there. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> okay. It's a bit of a lag. <laughs> so, so this is my summary of the ASTM standard. We lost what, it. What the crap? We, we lost the ASTM standard? Yeah. I think you guys are slow. Um, your connection because Daniel had it there before. I, I was, but, but, but now it's flipped to the UPP too. So go up two slides, please, Daniel. You had it originally. One more. Right there. We're slowed. We're slow. We are back. slow there. Give it a second and it will pop. There. It no. One more. I'm seeing AFTM. Okay. I'm seeing I three eight. Not zero two. All right. Give us a second. It's. All right. Well, I'll talk to it even though I don't see it. That's that's my summary of the ASTM standard, which is cited by both the Europeans and the US FAA. And although this is obviously not capable of showing in one slide everything that's in a hundred and something page document, this is pretty much the essentials of it. Um, broadcast grid is direct from the aircraft. Network grid can be from any part of the aircraft system. Um, the specific physical media that we're supposed to use for broadcast, we can use any media you would want for network. Um, Broadcast is direct to the observer device. Network is to a server, which an observer can then query. Um, and the, the big deal is that the security framing is specified, but the security methods are left entirely unspecified. And furthermore, the security framing gives too few bytes by far to use conventional digital signatures or certificates. Okay, the FAA NPRM, instead of looking at things as broadcast and network, looks at them primarily as standard or limited. Standard is for the big aircraft, well, bigger. Limited is for the small aircraft. They have to be operating within visual line of sight, within 400 feet of the pilot, et cetera. And the limited is gonna be network only. And it's not just that you're required to do network, and yeah, you can do broadcast if you want to or not. No, broadcast is actually prohibited. Um, you must do network and you must only do network if you're operating under the limited rules. And it gives the location of the pilot, not the location of the aircraft. And there are two ID types. ASTM actually defined three, but nobody is using type two. It's either the serial number, type one, or it's a uh, one-time use UTM assigned ID, type three. Next. Uh, I won't drill down into these, but anybody who really wants to stare at them, this gives you an idea of what the FAA is thinking right now for how remote ID fits into the overall UAS traffic management. Next. And this just drills down a little bit into specific use cases that the FAA is looking at. Um, one of them network oriented, one of them 
uh, broadcast oriented. Next. Um, this one now shows you how broadcast and network kind of come together. This is not broadcast remote ID and network remote ID coming together. This is broadcast remote ID and then the use of networks to do the lookups and then to perhaps do anything with the information you found once you did the lookup. But the ID is coming strictly over broadcast. Next. Um, there's a lot of commonality. There's some different nomenclature. Um, the big difference is that FAA says what you must do. ASTM says, well, here's a way that you could do it. Um, some differences in the details. Now, the NPRM says you've got to have error correction and you've got to have cybersecurity, whatever that word means. Uh, whereas ASTM specifies only the framing of authentication data, not any kind of authentication methods. And both of them give a nod to the idea of protecting privacy, but neither one of them gives you any suggestions on how to protect operator privacy. As a matter of fact, some of them require you to do things that are uh, you know, directly contrary to maintaining operator privacy. Next. Okay, so if we're gonna make this immediately actionable, that implies three sub goals. The information's gotta be trustworthy. If I'm gonna use this information to decide whether to shoot somebody down or not, it had better be good information. Um, we need to verify that the UAS is in a registry. And if we can say which registry it's in, now we can have registries of good guys and bad guys, if you will. Now, different observers are going to have different notions of who's a good guy and who's a bad guy, so they're going to trust different registries. But if I take, for instance, the perspective of the U.S. Air Force, if the Air Force runs a registry and I'm in the Air Force's registry, well, then the Air Force must have decided that I'm a good guy. Whereas if I'm in the registry that most people use when they bought a drone at Walmart, well, then the Air Force probably won't consider me to be necessarily a good guy. And all they need to know is which registry I'm in, and that's something that can be accomplished using the method that we've been pursuing without the observer having internet connectivity at that time. And then finally, the thing that we're really adding that goes way beyond what FAA, EU, or ASTM is even looking at is, you know, the one button established communications with a pilot so we can ask him to get the hell out of Dodge. Next. These are what I think are the general requirements, not for UAS RID, for TM RID to support UAS RID, right? There's a lot of other UAS RID requirements like anti-tamper and so on that, that go beyond where we live. But this is where I think it makes sense for ITF to be doing stuff to support UAS RID. Now, this list is probably incomplete. I hope other people will scrutinize it and tell me what I left out. Uh, now, the last paragraph there that's not a numbered requirement, it's not a requirement, but it is highly desirable that if we could do this, then we can get some ground truth information, independent measurements to try to figure out where that aircraft really is, as opposed to where he says he is. Any discussion on this slide before we move on? I'm not hearing any discussion on this. Okay, next then. Question, how do you intend to verify the identity of uh, the sender of the message? What is the idea of that? Uh, the first line, verify that the message originated from the claimant sender. There is an so idea I'll, how to do that? Yeah, so all I mean by that is that the sender will have an ID that he is broadcasting, and the sender will also be signing messages that he sends, we'll be able to verify that the signatures correspond to the asserted ID. Now, whether the ID is really Adam Whitaker is not something that can be addressed um, at that level. That needed to be addressed in the registry, that before they registered that ID for him, you know, they wanted to take his blood type and know his mother's maiden name and whatever else. So you are assuming that you're going to be a kind of a public key infrastructure with exchange of certificates to guarantee that? Public key structure. Yeah, a, a concise public key structure and registries, they have some kind of vetting. And, and we're not saying what the vetting needs to be, 
We're saying that if we help an observer identify which registry an aircraft is in, as well as you know which ID number does he have within that registry, then all he needs to do is look at what are that registry's vetting procedures. And if he is satisfied with the registry's vetting procedures, then he has confidence in this ID. If he's not satisfied with the registry's vetting procedures, he can you know act on that information. I'm sorry, I do have to go. I require commitment. I, I, I basically say my slides just say um, things are, are are good with my drafts, and we can talk more about them on, on the list. But I'm sorry, I have to go now. Bye. Okay. Have a happy day, Bob. We'll look at your slides in a, in a short time. Okay. Bye, Bob. All right. So anyway, this slide was my general requirements doing TM RID stuff for unmanned aircraft systems. The next slide is more specific. So just um, one thing, um, I think with the requirement, uh, we should use the, the, um, the ITF language, which is should, must, this kind of thing. So there will be some, um, that does not prevent to, to, to discuss those, but uh, at the end, we, we, there, there are probably some um, different level of requirements um, and that, I think using the, the ITF language might be useful. Yes, I agree. And in the actual drafts, um, I try to use the language. Okay, uh, good. On the slides, I was just keeping it terse. Yeah, okay, good. All right, next. Okay, now these are requirements not on TMRID methods, but on TMRID identifiers. It's gotta be 20 bytes or smaller to fit within the ASTM standard and the FAA and the EU like the ASTM standard. And the reason it has to be 20 bytes is they got to fit within a Bluetooth 4.x packet after various overheads. Um, then fundamentally, um, we want to identify what registry is this guy in? And then we need a unique key within that registry to look up information specifically about this guy or this aircraft. Now, the scope within which uniqueness is required is I think a subject for some study and discussion. Um, and then requirement number five, it's unfortunate that Bob had to leave because um, he wrote that one and I'm not entirely clear on exactly what he meant by it. Um, I, I captured it in my requirements draft. But I really need to, to have further discussions with Bob to find out exactly what he meant. And I might want to reword it a little bit so that it'll be clear to, to everyone what he meant. Okay. Those last three bullets are not numbered requirements on the identifiers. I didn't really know how to, to represent them. Um, we don't want to facilitate adversarial correlation of EIS operational patterns. There may be one more than one way to do that. The most obvious way is the FAA's adoption of ASTM type three, that each identifier will be used one time and one time only. But the problem is when you consider that there's Ryan, any idea how many small drones are out there already flying around? No, I don't think anybody could give you. Is a it solid, upwards of a million? I don't think anybody could give you a solid number on that. It's, I have no idea. Okay, I, I'm going to guess it's upwards of a million already, right? Uh, it's certainly in the hundreds of thousands at least. Um, if people are doing one time use identifiers in order to avoid this adversarial correlation, then we really got to have scalable timely registration methods for, oh, I got a new ID, I got a new ID, I got a new ID. Um, then the next bullet, um, we need to be able to prove ownership of a claimed ID. Um, and ideally, you want an observer to be able to, to check the proof when he's out in the middle of the forest fighting a forest fire and he doesn't have any internet connectivity. Um, and the last bullet, I don't know, that might be kind of redundant with the number one requirement on the previous page. The 20 bytes requirement is from FAA rulemaking or is from ASTM? It is from ASTM, but the FAA has specifically cited the ASTM standard as a quote, accepted means of compliance, end quote. I see any of the, uh, the registry, can I think of registry that are USS or in the UTM or some other entities? I think that a USS operator 
will need just to operate a USS um, most, if not all, of the information that is required in UAS Remote ID. And so it would be very natural for a UAS operator to run a registry or at least to be a registrar, which is subtly different. There's a one contra very controversial uh, comment from the public. Uh, if, uh, if everybody going to have to pay money to USS to a uh, subscription in order to fly a drone. Uh, so on top of the question you answered, that will be, for now is 1.5 million, 1 million drones registered. That's only registered, right? Are those people going to pay money to the registry to get this drone registered uh, in order to fly? Yeah, I agree with you. There's a lot of pushback on that. I don't know how that's going to go. There are some possibilities. I mean, if you were willing to make this information publicly available, you know, I'll use the, the, the curse word with a B, okay? Post it all in a blockchain, right? You've registered it. Um, <laughs> all right, all my coworkers are fleeing to Rome. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm, regarding, I'm regarding that issue of who does this vetting and how good is the vetting and what does it cost you to get vetted and end up in the registry as once again, a little above my pay grade, but I think we can provide methods that could be used by an entity that's going to be performing that process. Yeah, this is a requirement that normally comes from the aviation community. Nobody, nobody could be flying without being you know who they are and they have to be registered like a managed aircraft today. Obviously, this is divided by areas, but depending on the area you are flying, yeah, you are going to have to be registered and you're going to have to broadcast your ID or you don't fly. Simple like that. Safety reasons. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I've got on this. And I think we're close to the end of this first deck. Yep. Yeah. That was the end. So I think we're going to stop the, the meeting now. Okay. Um, so what I, I think what is important is that we agree on the requirements. Um, so it would be, uh, well, how, how far you are with the architecture document? I've submitted, a, I've uploaded a double lot. Um, it uses a lot of uh, musts and a few shoulds and a few mays. It doesn't have any ASCII art in it yet. Um, the ASCII art that it's going to need will mostly be um, talking about USSs uh, and uh, supplemental data service providers and where they all fit into the picture. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that it'll get some scrutiny. Okay, so what I think, because what I think it would be good is that um, it's going to be quite aggressive, but if we get sufficient discussions uh, by the, the next ITF on the requirements and we have something that is quite stable, that would be a very good thing. And then the ITF, we spend it on the architecture. Um, that would be a good way to speed up things. So the thing is that what I'd like is that we were able to, to convey some people to discuss the requirements and see how much we're ready for that requirements. Um, I think a goal would be that after the ITF, we sent a working group last call for the requirements. Um, it would be, I think that's the thing we should target somehow. Um, and that would be good challenge being that uh, people got involved and, and say, yes, we agree on the requirements. It's exactly what we need. Okay. So you're saying immediately after Vancouver, uh, working group last call on requirements? It would be, that's something we should target. So we should not, I mean, uh, the thing is that we should try to convey the people um, right now instead of waiting for the meeting and then starting asking those people to get involved so i, I think the requirement document 
uh, looks pretty advanced to me. Um, and so it might be time we can use, uh, yeah, people say, if, if you disagree, say whether you disagree or, I mean, it's time to say it. Um, so I think that's something we should try to advertise them maybe as soon as the working group is formed, but we should try, uh, I would say, immediately. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, the requirements document is, I'm sure, horribly inadequate, but it's the best effort by a guy who's never written one in IETF land before. And until I get feedback, I don't know how to fix it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But one thing is the IETF language, and the other one is uh, uh, people sort of agree on that. So um, I think that would be good. Um, we should try, I mean, there were some interesting people in the first meeting um, in Singapore. So I'm thinking people from Mozilla, they were uh, pretty much uh, concerned about the privacy. So those ones should be, it would be good to provide some feedbacks. And um, the other person from New Zealand, um, uh, Andrew. Andrew so, yeah. Uh, it would be good. He could um, get involved in reading those. Um, I think that's. I'm going to contact Andrew. Do you know the people from Mozilla? I do not. I don't think I got a card from them. So. Okay, I do not either. So. Normally, the blue sheets are available. And they are scanned available somewhere. Okay. Blue sheets. So, yeah. So that's one way to reach them out. Um, I'd like to to send also the um, the documents to some people I know at Airbus. But these are um, random people um, from uh, that company, so. I know, I know Roger Taylor. Okay, so from feel Air free to contact those people. He was interested, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we should try to to have a, a more review so that I mean the requirement is going to be really the kicking start but, uh, starting point for the work. So it's important we don't delay that work. That's my um... great. I agree. Yeah, I know it's a common problem and, and a mistake to get the architecture before the requirements, um, but that's kind of what we've done here, uh, at least in terms of documenting them. Uh, I think the requirements were pretty well, but implicitly understood by the people working in UAS remote ID because they were largely, you know, laid out by the FAA's uh, aviation rulemaking committee and so on. But in terms of turning them, in, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, we need to we need to translate what the ARC said and what the EU said and what the ASTM said and what the FAA has said into IETFEs and, and get it in a in the draft. Yeah. And um, yeah, this uh, so this uh, document is going to be probably uh, informational um, anyway. But um, a way to move that aware uh, ahead is um, it's a good start. And uh, I don't know if uh, having the architecture pretty much advanced to me, it looks like uh, we're moving things ahead. So maybe that's going to help the people to to get involved too. So I, I don't think there is an order or specific order into that. So all right, I think so. The excellent point is that uh, send me the minutes, and uh, we should try to contact um, other people um, to get more review on the the requirements. The more review you can get for the Vancouver, the better we are. Okay. Okay, and don't forget as well to send me the your update or your ASA reference. I guess that's what you are meaning for the charter. And once you got the charter, they can we can create the group, and then we can adopt the document, and then we can request publication. So yeah. that would be cool. Excellent. And don't I forget to put the meeting in the the minute meetings into the material for the meetings as well, right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Eric, for staying so late. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Daniel, for for <laughs> running it and for the documents. Okay, see you in Vancouver, everyone. See you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, Michael, for being here, even though you couldn't speak. <laughs> I can speak now. I, I've arrived at my back at my office apartment. Oh, uh, just in time. <laughs>
Well done. But I, I did drop my phone while shopping groceries while listening to you, and now I have a crack, so I'm really pissed. I'm sorry. Yeah. Weird, All right, anyway, thanks a lot. No problem. Thank you, Michael. Talk to you later. Have fun. Because my headphones are attached. Flipped around in a stupid way. Okay, <laughs> bye-bye. <laughs> All right, see you guys. How do I leave this bloody thing? <laughs> is it this red X? It is this. Demeaning.